The segment of the show we are beginning now is the talking point. And here's what we're discussing. It's got to do with uh, the Energy Summit Ghana, which was uh, addressed by the Minerals and Energy Minister Gwede Mantashe some time ago, where he told delegates that South Africa's energy future was to transition to low carbon emissions. But the truth of the matter is that South Africa is heavily reliant on fossil fuels and in particular coal. So we've also invested hugely in coal-fired power plants that have only just been connected to the national grid. So where does our future lie? We speak now to Advocate Tabom Gwena. He's the Director General at uh, the Ministry of Minerals and Energy. DG, thank you very much for making the time to talk to thank us. Thank you very much, Polly. Uh, Good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon to you, sir. I'd like to start with um, a matter of uh, Nilimani. On the 5th of February this year, we are going to officially mark six years since the workers who were working inside a container were buried alive six years ago. What's taking so long to retrieve that container? Thank you very much, uh, Tolly. Uh, good afternoon to your viewers at home. We must uh, confirm that as the department, uh, we have done everything that is legally and humanly possible uh, to assist the process. Um, you will recall that we first started with uh, an inquiry on the Lily Mine. Before you can retrieve that container, there are certain processes that uh, had to take place, and those processes are still taking place. Now, we started with an inquiry led by the department. We made our findings based on the inquiry on Lily Mine, that it is evident that the CEO and the executive management of Lily Mine are responsible for the incident that occurred at Lily Mine. Mm -hmm. Now, out of that uh, process, the NPA uh, is required to do its work. I'm sure you're aware that uh, there is an inquest, and we are uh, you know, optimistic that uh, whoever that is a culprit on the Lily Mine incident will then you know, face the full mighty of the law, especially the executive management of Lily Mine. Now, we started the process in 2018 because for that mine to, uh, to be able to retrieve that container, you need to have an operation or someone that is keen to acquire the mine. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2018, towards the end of the year, we were put under pressure as a department for the Section 11 application. Section 11, it is when um, a new company or another company acquire you know, the assets of company B or X. Now, as you know that uh, the mine is under BRP or business rescue, mm -hmm. because it is under business uh, rescue, now we, we can't intervene the way we will uh, do under the normal circumstances. Mm -hmm when we are implementing our laws, which is the Mine Health and Safety Act and also NPRDA. Now here, Chapter 6 of the Companies Act uh, came in under the BRPs, and so which means there is nothing that we can do as the department. Yeah. Now, after we have approved this Section 11, another protracted legal battle uh, started between um, Vantage and the company that um, we approved in Section 11. Remember now, uh, at that stage, it is at a commercial uh, stage. We can't uh, interfere with that process. They took each other to the courts. Even to date, they are still in courts. And now this protracted uh, legal battle is delaying the acquisition of this mine so that whoever that is a successful uh, bidder mm -hmm. should be able to then to start with the process of retrieving the container. That's where we are at, and that's what we have been doing. All right. L let me ask you to just pause there for a moment. Interesting words from you right at the start of your answer. 
and that is to say the matter is in the hands of the NPA. It's important that they do their job. Are you saying that the previous owners, or should I say the owners of this mine, because clearly they still own the mine, the owners of this mine did something wrong. They violated the laws of the country in terms of mining, and therefore they must be prosecuted. Is that what you are telling us indirectly? It is not indirectly, it is directly. Uh, as I've said that, the executive management of Lili Mine are responsible for what happened there. Out of the inquiry, it has been confirmed that they did not do what they were supposed to do. As simple as that. What was it that they were supposed to do that they did not do? To make sure that the stability of the underground it's, it's up to the required standard. The pillars, they must monitor. Mm -hmm. There must not be any tampering with the pillars underground. And now it has been found that uh, there had been a fall of ground, which the management did not do anything. There were signals yeah. before this incident. And the management was fast asleep. They did not do anything. Maybe they were trying to prioritize the profit. And so it's, it's, it's a very bad thing that, I mean, you know, they should have taken the necessary steps immediately because all these issues were raised even by the inspectorate, I mean, from the side of the department, that these are the areas that you must be careful that if you don't do what you are required to do in terms of the law, you may have a challenge here. Those are very strong words you used, Advocate McGuinn. Yes. The management was fast asleep. Surely... If you are not fast asleep as a department, you should have laid charges, criminal charges against them. It's a process, actually. It is easy to say that. Uh, you need to engage on a process. That is why we have dealt with the inquiry. The inquiry has been concluded. Then the report has been handed over to NPA. Then NPA is starting with its process as well. And so... We have done our part um, as the department. Is it true what families are suggesting, DG, that the very owner that you say was fast asleep and ignored signals, which then led to the accident that occurred, is it true that they are preventing the takeover of this mine by the prospective buyer? Actually, what I can say is that for, for us, I mean, we don't see any reason why Vantage should be involved in a protracted legal battle for whoever company that wants to acquire the mine. Mm -hmm. Because we called the CEO, he came to the office, we sat down with him, and we posed a, a, a specific question to say to him that, CEO, can you tell us what is your interest in this mine? Why are you inhibiting the acquisition of this mine? Mm -hmm. We've got no interest as to who takes the mine, but what is your problem? He then said, no, we want a credible company to take over this mine. Now, said no, but you can't tell us about a credible company that you want to take uh, this mine because yourself you have failed. Of course, from our side as the department, we want a credible mining company to take over that mine. Mm. But the CEO is not competent enough to have said that he wants a, you know, a, a credible mining company to take over this operation. Because DG, DG, with all due respect, someone listening to you right now is saying, how is it possible that a custodian of mines in South Africa is being told what to do and what not to do by someone who, in your words, has violated the country's mining rules or mining laws? Why are you being told what to do by someone who has broken the law in the first place? Why don't you just take the mine away? You see, clearly, you need to understand that we have companies act, I tried to explain in the beginning. Now, once a mine or any business, it is under business rescue mm. process. The prescripts that you as the department 
you are administering, they don't become effective. Mm. That is the reason why we should have dealt with this matter a long time ago. In terms of the law, the minister is empowered to cancel the mining right. There we go. Yes. Now, you first start with uh, Section 93, which will then look at the corrective measures. If the mine it is operating normally, then there are certain transactions or uh, contraventions that have been committed by the mine. Mm. Now, here, the reason why, at the moment, we can't do anything. You remember that the minister has been on, uh, on record in, on public uh, platforms saying that there is a problem with this Chapter 6 of Companies Act, especially for the BRPs. Because sometimes the BRPs themselves, with actually all fairness, we do have the BRPs that are good, that are doing their work within the prescribed time frame. We have some BRPs that are too comfortable to stay longer in a transaction because that is value for them. They get in money. Of course. And so on our side, because we are not responsible for Chapter 6, we are not administering Chapter 6, we can't do anything. That is the law. All right. And yes. <laughs> you can't do anything. You know? And so when you say words like that to the families who are looking for closure. They are desperate for closure. I'm not going to tell you what culture says. You're an African. You know how important these things mean to families. Mm. So for the time being, what you're telling us is that you can't even give a timeline as to when these families might have the remains of their loved ones brought to surface so that they can go and lay, t and lay them to rest in a dignified manner. Koli, we can't make a commitment that we'll not be able to honor. Our commitment is to support all the efforts uh, by different stakeholders for the acquisition of that mine so that whoever that is a successful uh, bidder should have an opportunity of retrieving that container. Is that it is your view as a department that the container can be retrieved? Because there are those who say the, the ground is simply too unstable. There's nothing that can be done. Well, out of the interactions that we have been having, I mean, um, it, it is possible because uh, if you have a, a company that is going to operate the mine, uh, that company must go underground uh, for it to operate. And so clearly I it is possible. I mean, uh, maybe through a decline shaft, uh, they can be able to access the container. Uh, and so that is what you were told by the pro prospective buyer, that this is what they are capable of doing. Certainly, certainly. And so, but the problem is now with the mine management. The current owners. The current owners. They are not keen to allow anyone to take over. Well, I mean, maybe for uh, to put it within a correct perspective, to say that uh, any company uh, to take over, except a company that is of their preference, mm. I'll say so, because we've got, I mean, uh, we fail to understand why at the moment they can't allow whoever that has put an offer to take over the mine, they are refusing. And some people, it is easy for them to go out and say, no, the department is not doing anything. We have done a lot. We are still doing a lot of work with uh, the, the, I mean, you know, the people there to make sure that we assist. At any given time or whenever there is an issue, we dispatch our inspectors to go to assist. And so it is not like the government has not been doing anything. Oh. As I've explained, that there are applicable prescripts. As a department, we can only do up until a particular point. Yeah. Then beyond that, we can't do anything. All right. You're watching Politics Unscripted, the segment of the show. It is the talking point, and we are in conversation with uh, Advocate Tabum Gwena. He is the Director General of the Department of Minerals and Energy. Let's talk energy, Advocate Mugwena, and it's the just transition.
just energy transition of South Africa. At the moment, the country has about 16 coal-fired power stations. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. And these stations, according to the literature I've read, they provide about 75% of the country's electricity generation. Now, the question I have for you is, as per the country's plans, how many of these power plants, coal-fired power plants, are and should be shut down by 2030? Uh, let me start here, Kloli. Um, I think it is important to give context uh, to your question. Yes. Um, we have made a commitment um, as a department that um, when you look at uh, IRP 2019, we have made a clear commitment that we need to come up with a just energy transition and we must consolidate our efforts. Uh, here I'm referring to different uh, stakeholders. I mean, that would be government, uh, labor, uh, communities, and business. That is point number one. Now, the other issue that we need to commit uh, on uh, that I just want to highlight, uh, maybe to clarify some of the things that have been said on the public space. The department is committed mm -hmm. to just energy transition. But what we are saying is that uh, this must be done in a pace and scale that is not disruptive to our base load. Mm -hmm. And we subscribe to the international agreements that we have entered into of uh, moving from uh, high emission to lower, I mean high uh, carbon emissions to lower carbon emissions. And so that is a commitment that we have made. Now, when you look at um, RP um, 2019, we also uh, make a commitment in that document for the decommissioning of the coal powered um, uh, power stations. Now, we have a big chunk which is for the renewable uh, energy, uh, close to 23,000 uh, megawatts are for renewable, then the remainder of 31 uh, megawatts are for the other uh, technologies uh, that I will uh, cover um, at the end. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we are committed, and so we have quite a sizable number, of course, of the stations that uh, will need to be decommissioned. Yeah. Um, we are now accounting for plus or minus 75 percent of the total energy that we are consuming as the country mm. and that comes from these uh, coal powered uh, power stations and so the commitment is there uh, of uh, you know ESCOM implementing uh, the plan to decommission yeah. uh, those uh, coal powered uh, uh, I mean stations right. and it's quite a significant number let's put it into, into perspective for the viewer the context here, DG, is yeah. that ESCOM, as of the moment, has about 48,000 megawatts of energy that is generated through coal-fired power stations. Now, my understanding is that of that, there is a demand that a third a third of these power stations must be shut down in order for the country to comply with the legal limits of pollution. Mm. Am I correct? Yeah. On that point, uh, let me first start with the implementation of the RP 2019. Then we'll be able to then to have a, a much better understanding of the work that we are doing. You must also appreciate the fact that we are dealing with the energy aspect, you know, aspects in, in this. And so you have uh, ESCOM on the you know, operational side. And so ours is more on the policy side. We are defined as a, a procurer mm. f through the IPP office. Now, I will start first with what we have done um, as the department, you remember that we completed the 
between the four last year. Now, uh, around uh, 2,205 uh, megawatts we committed uh, on between the four, even though that uh, only uh, 2,105 has been connected to the grid by the end of December last yeah. year. We are still left with 100 megawatts that uh, because of some uh, challenges with the projects, uh, but they will be resolved. And so that is uh, step number one of what we have done uh, to assist in this uh, energy crisis that we are having. Number two, we also issued a request for proposals for 2,000 megawatts. That is what we call a risk mitigation independent power producer procurement program. Uh, it simply um, you know, translates into an emergency procurement of energy. Yeah. Now, on that one, as you are aware that uh, the matter is still with the courts, I may not actually get into the merits or demerits of the matter. But uh, as for us, as the department, we have done what we have committed will do in terms of the RP to procure that uh, 2,000 uh, megawatts, mm -hmm. which gave us 1,996 uh, megawatts. We did not get the exact uh, 2,000 megawatts. The other issue that I think it is important to take note of is between the five. Um, between the five, we're talking of renewable energy. It is also our endeavor to ensure that we comply with the Paris Agreement mm. because there we have uh, 2,600 megawatts of the renewable energy. Uh, when you move further uh, to between the six, we, I mean, let me conclude on this point, uh, actually. On this 2,600 megawatts under bid window five, we have appointed 25 successful uh, bidders yes. uh, that I'm sure you're aware of. And we have I mean, received uh, around uh, 2,000 um, 583 megawatts out of that, uh, you know, uh, tender. And so the financial close will take place around uh, April. Now, that is what we are doing as a department. I see that you want to come in, then I'll proceed with the next... Uh, uh, please, you? because my, my interest here, and I would want to think that's what the viewers also want to know, that as a country, we are clearly heavily reliant on coal-fired power stations which at the moment are providing the country with 75% of electricity. However, the country is also under pressure to start reducing um, the carbon emissions and therefore all that it is doing is relying on waivers, pollution waivers, in order for it to continue using these power stations. And so I go back to my original question that of the 16 power stations that we have that are driven by coal, how many are due for a shutdown in 2030? Well, as I've said, that uh, we, we have quite a sizable number. I may not give the exact number, but we've got quite a sizable number. But our commitment, it is around how much are we willing to bring in in a form of uh, renewable energy, coal, um, storage and also other sources of um, uh, you know energy and now that is a commitment that we we have made uh, mm -hmm. as a department but maybe to to respond to your question which maybe may create a little bit of a challenge to the viewers at home on how are we going to achieve what we have committed that will be able to achieve as the country and also how do we balance again I mean, looking at the coal, which is our base load. Mm. That is why, as a department, we have been very uh, firm on our position that we can't abruptly say that we're going to do away with coal. It is not possible. Now, we need to be systematic. Again, what is important is investment mm -hmm. in uh, what we call a, a, a cleaner coal technologies. On that point exactly, did you? I'm going to interrupt and yes. say to you, <laughs> cleaner coal energy solutions that will involve the technology that will allow for coal to be used, which we have in South Africa in abundance, but only this time we're employing technology 
for it to not pollute the air. Here's what the CEO of ESCOM told me last year on this show. And he said, at Machuba Power Station, we have tried to experiment with under, underground uh, coal gasification. And he says, that has not been a success. It's not commercial. We have offered the Council of Geosciences to make available that site for them to use a, as a carbon capture and sequestration demonstration project. And that discussion is ongoing. So your proposal that technology might be employed in order to allow for coal to continue to be used, only this time you're employing technology so that it is acceptable in the atmosphere, it's not going to fly. So wh where are you hoping to get these technologies? You know, Kweli, you don't have uh, a quick fix to a dynamic challenge that you are dealing with. You must be patient mm -hmm. when you are dealing with a matter of this magnitude. Now, let me explain. At the moment, we are having a, a, a pilot project in Pumalanga. Mm -hmm. The Council for Geoscience, um, supported by the World Bank, we are having this pilot project for carbon capture, uh, storage, and uh, utilization. That's what we are busy with at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you are aware uh, that uh, we, we, are, we are looking broadly around the challenges that are affecting uh, the, the coal industry. Um, and uh, um, you, you have been invited, uh, you know, as the media to a meeting on Tuesday where we'll be meeting with the coal producers. Hopefully you'll be there as well. <laughs> where we'll be interacting with the coal producers and other relevant stakeholders. Mm. And so what you're saying is that I hear you with what the CEO said, but I'm coming from the policy side. You're saying that the initiatives that we have put in place or that are still actually, you know, uh, ongoing uh, to ensure that we invest on uh, research and development. And DG, so remember that DG, that takes uh, let, let me stop time. There. Let me stop you there. Andre Director's point is that the country simply has no money to play around with. In fact, his words were, we don't have money to experiment with. We've tried this. It has not worked. You, at policy level, you still want to experiment when you are told by the people that are actually on the ground implementing that it's not doable. So <laughs> that creates what becomes known as the policy uncertainty in the country. Is, is it not? You, you follow the policy. Mm -hmm. um, as long as people can follow the policy, they will never go wrong. Now, the policy uncertainty will come when in your implementation you will try to be creative, to come up with something. And now, what you are saying, and we have made a clear commitment mm. in the RP 2019 to look at those um, cleaner coal technologies. Mm. And that is why we are calling upon the relevant stakeholders. And so we must not be shy that, I mean, you know, there are people that are making noise that uh, coal is dirty, is, it, it, it is polluting. We have taken note of that. Mm. But you must not take a cover because of somebody that is making a noise uh, than you uh, who have a systematic uh, process in place to make sure that we safeguard the interest of this country. No, you can't just abruptly move away from coal. That is why we will continue emphasizing this fact that we have a responsibility to invest resources on research and development. We'll get a solution. All right. I think your, your comments are clearly now in line with the one person you talk about making noise, with the one person who has been making the most noise in the country about how there is no way we can do away with coal. And I'll ask in a moment as to what the noise that the DG talks about, including his minister, how do these noise around the use of coal in the country align with the stated objective of the country. And by the way, we are signatories to international laws about carbon emissions. How does it align with the fact that the country needs to transition away from coal at some point? 
you're watching Politics Unscripted, the segment of the show, it is the talking point, and uh, we're talking to the Director General at the Ministry of Minerals and Energy, Advocate Tabo Mkwena. Uh, Director General, we at the tail end of our discussion, but the viewer has got to get a sense as to where are we going as a country. And I think before the break, it's quite clear in your words and the words of your minister that we are there's a misalignment. There's a misalignment simply because Mandasha's words are as follows when it comes to the use of coal in the country. And he says, I quote, we have a duty to protect that sector, grow it, and make it benefit as long as it can. These are the minister's words. Now, I don't think there's any argument that for Mr. Mandasha, it's clear there is not going to be any rush to shut down coal power plants. And that is the route that is going to hold, at least for the time that he is the Minister of Energy. Am I wrong? Not for the time that he's still a Minister of Energy. Uh, he is the executive authority of the department. Mm -hmm. And he will put, I mean, he would uh, come up with uh, policy mechanisms and those policy mechan mechanisms are not for Minister Mantashe, are for the department. Yeah. Um, he likes making this um, analogy that, um, you know, you guys in the administration will fail to understand that you've got uh, too much responsibility because you are part of the state. We are government. We come in, we come out, come and go. Mm -hmm. And so when there are policies that have been crafted, it is incumbent upon you as the state there is referring to the technocrats to ensure that you continue with the implementation of those policies and so that is why i'm saying that uh, those policies will be implemented whether minister mantasha is the minister or is not the minister because they are policies of government let me go back to your initial question before the break i want to bring in the international uh, lessons into this conversation. You know that in Europe, you still have European countries that are still uh, using coal. Mm -hmm. You are aware of that. And so I'm sure you are aware, uh, probably because you should know. A country like Germany, Poland, Greece, and Spain, they're still using coal mm -hmm. in Europe. You also have America that is still using coal. You have India as well that uh, continues to use coal. And when you look at the numbers, they're quite huge yeah. uh, on some of those countries. Now, that is why it is very important that as the country, we must be careful of uh, developed economies that uh, because of the offerings that they're making mm. um, of finances or technologies, then we have to change our policy direction. It can't be. We can't change our policy direction abruptly yeah. because we are being offered monies. Yes, we will use that money. And so I want to factor in this as well to say that we need to have a well-guided uh, framework or agreement on how this, um, you know, we, ha we have what we call a climate fund should be utilized to assist us in accelerating the implementation of the RP 2019, and yeah. also to assist ESCOM with the, the I mean, you know, decommissioning of uh, its uh, coal-powered stations. That climate fund you speak about, Director General, does it include in it the recent pledges that were made by European countries of the sum of 131 million rand? When is that going to come into the country, if at all? Yes, well, uh, I will not be in a position of explaining in detail that process, but at the high level, at the policy level, what we are saying is that even when it comes to donor funding and grants, remember that you have a climate fund, mm -hmm. you also have a donor funding, you have grants, and there must be a clear guidelines, an agreement that is developed on how those resources can be utilized to advance our developmental objectives. Yeah. But the point that I was also trying to make here is that 
if we allow our policies to be influenced by the developed economies, we are going to sterilize the very same mineral resources, in particular coal, that you are having here. And so it is important we are going to have ghost towns, and that is going to create a problem for our people. Now, it is important that we must have a social dialogue, and the department is developing a clear framework, a roadmap, yeah. on the just energy a transition and we believe it is only through that uh, coordinated process by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy we will be able to decarbonize both mining and also the, the, the energy sectors and so yeah. that is our commitment as a department and that is a policy position of the department and whoever uh, especially on those sectors must be able to understand and appreciate that those policy instruments they must be followed. I, is it not better, therefore, to conclude that for as long as we have coal deposits in the country, for as long as we are rich in coal, we're not going to do away with that resource. If anything, we are going to find technologies that will make it acceptable for it to be used as long as it doesn't pollute the atmosphere. Is that the position? Absolutely. Wow. <sighs> Director General, then th there is another element to this, and it has to do with uh, the transformation objectives of the country. And by that, we mean the number of coal mines that are now in the hands of black people. How many would you say uh, there have been in the country thus far? Yeah, well, we have uh, quite a significant number of um, black players in the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I would not want to mention the names of the, the companies, but uh, as you know that some of the companies have offloaded their assets. Maybe I can mention their names because it is for public knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you will remember that uh, Anglo uh, Coal, uh, they have offloaded quite a significant uh, number of their assets to Siriti, mm -hmm. which is a, a consortium of a, a, a black-owned uh, companies. We also have um, Siriti again acquiring uh, the assets of uh, South 32, mm -hmm. 32. And so we have other uh, players uh, as well, I mean, that uh, are doing quite very well in the industry, like uh, Black Royalty Minerals, um, you also have, um, you know, companies like um, Zimkulu. There are quite a number of them that are black-owned that yeah. are doing uh, very well. I would not mention, uh, uh, you know, them with their names, but there is actually a shift. Now, the minister at some point even said that uh, there are people that are claiming or alleging that there is a concentration when you have black people acquiring these assets. Hmm. But when you have these uh, other companies acquiring the assets, there's no concentration. And so now we can say that um, we are doing very well um, yeah. and we are optimistic that uh, we'll continue to have more black-owned companies uh, acquiring uh, you know, more assets, not only even in uh, mining, even in other commodities as yeah. well. Yeah. The, the, the interesting point here is that among the power stations that are scheduled for shutdown in the year 2030, and these are mines that recently were given partial waivers in terms of uh, the amount of pollution that they produce. One of them is Arnott Coal, and that mine recently gotten into the hands of black players, and I think it has been punted as an example of what broad-based economic empowerment should look like. But that very same mine, or at least power station rather, that same power station that is provided with coal by Arnott Coal, the mine, it is due for shutdown in 2030. Are you saying that that possibly could not be the case, that that mine or that power station uh, shouldn't be shut down? Remember, we have what you call a repurposing of the, the coal-powered uh, power stations. Yeah. 
And so that is one avenue that can be exploited as well at Arnott uh, Mine, mm -hmm. that uh, for the repurposing, uh, depending on the appetite of the people that are operating Arnott Mine, yeah. then because remember that is a cost plus a mine, Arnott Mine. Uh, and so there is an opportunity for the, you know, those companies that are in the industry also to, to participate because we are dealing with uh, cost plus mines. And so if then they have appetite to participate, uh, the uh, most welcome to do so because on the repurposing of the coal uh, power stations, there will be opportunities. But of course, we are very much mindful, you know, of the socioeconomic uh, challenges that uh, are associated with this process. Advocate Tabu Mkwena, thank you very much for your time. It has been uh, an interesting conversation. Director General of um, the Minerals and Energy Department.